Hi everyone, welcome to the Horacis Global Meeting. And my name is Diana Sabrin, co-founder and CEO of OneAgrix. And thank you very much for joining our panel session today, Demographic Changes Demand Better Agricultural Processes. And I am very happy to welcome you, our five esteemed panelists. Um, we do have, uh, who is the president and CEO of Crop Life International. We do have here Jayesh Ranjan, Principal Secretary, Government of Telangana, India. We have here Dr. Pietro Paganini, co-founder of Compitier, Italy. And uh, we have Mark Titterington, co-founder, Forum of the Future of Agriculture, United Kingdom. Um, one more um, that we are expecting is Stan Woods, Chief Impact Officer, The Kind Village, Canada. So now what, what we'll be discussing today, um, and I'll give a little background on it on, we're discussing that despite a slowdown in global population growth, people are still migrating to towns, leaving rural areas in need of rapid agricultural technology development. Plant yields are still low and food waste too high. Is greater automation the answer or do better solutions rest with big data analysis and AI? How to educate for change in lands disrupted by COVID. And this is a very exciting topic, um, where which is pertinent as you see COVID-19 and supply chain disruption and food resilience being tested. And I would love, um, you know, Julia, for you to give your viewpoints on what do you think um, is, is the solution to solve this? Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I, I'm, I want to say I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss together the, this important topic. Uh, Diana, that you mentioned the demographic changes, uh, the ba demand better agricultural processes. Uh, I would like to see, couldn't be a more timely, uh, we are discussing at this moment, we are discussing at a global level the future of food. Uh, we see really events like this uh, gathering together a key moment to collectively debate uh, the role of, that innovation and technologies can play in addressing the paradox of producing more nutritious food for a, for a growing population within the planetary boundaries. Uh, uh, and I would like to say, that, Diana, that really agriculture lies at the very center of this debate and the role that can play in addressing the, the global, uh, these, global, these challenges. Uh, Crop Life International, uh, this is the federation uh, representing globally the plant science industry. Our purpose is to advance innovation in agriculture with a view of sustainable future um, and by working with other stakeholders uh, playing a role, a leading role in enabling sustainable food systems uh, transformation. In the work we do to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, uh, working with our members, uh, um, we we are uh, jo we are joining forces towards ambitions of zero hunger, carbon neutrality, and natural positive solutions. Uh, leveraging the commitments uh, on a responsible innovation grounded in science, uh, transparency, and uh, uh, product stewardship. So we see really innovation in agriculture as key to address the challenges that you, you mentioned, allowing farmers to, to produce uh, uh, more nutritious food while at the same time reduce, reducing uh, emissions holding the biodiversity loss uh, and improving the um, the conditions of the rural communities and uh, livelihoods. So, uh, I would like also to add uh, that there is uh, now also more clearly a need to understand the origin of the food and the ingredients that are behind the, the brands, so going really at the roots uh, from fork to farm. Uh, and this is driven by uh, changing consumers' demand, purpose-driven brands, but also retailers, uh, and uh, ultimately shareholders and stakeholders. Uh, at the same time, we see there is uh, also less and less people directly connected with food production and farming, which represents uh, a major challenge. We see a Crop Life International there really uh, a point in time that we constructively engage uh, together to break down the silos and address more collaboratively 
these issues to build innovative partnerships to address these challenges. And innovation uh, has the opportunity to go, to go well beyond uh, R&D and technologies. It can also drive how we approach uh, collaborations, uh, how we forge uh, new partnerships, uh, how we can generate together um, a new ideas to pursue the best solutions in face of the challenges uh, you mentioned. Uh, the opportunity and the challenges uh, ahead of us are uh, demographic changes, climate changes are simply too big to be met by one company or by one organization alone. Uh, this requires uh, a new approach, a new way we address these systemic changes. And we also know that this area is not without challenges and challengers uh, but at Crop Life International, we see with the industry really full aligned and working with others uh, uh, really to, to, to deliver together on uh, more sustainable food systems. So this is why conversations like uh, the one today are so important. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. That, that was very important points you have made, especially on the part that, um, you know, no one company could solve feeding humanity. No one company could, could um, you know, uh, really support communities. There needs to be collaboration between numerous organizations from government all the way to the private sector. And then um, come the point of rural communities and livelihoods, with, with, which you have mentioned. And this is where, you know, naturally, um, I, I would like um, Jayesh to actually comment. And Jayesh, you know, you, 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 um, you know, have experience with the government of Telangana, with rural farmers, with the community. So perhaps we could hear your viewpoints on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Greetings, uh, fellow panelists. Greetings to all the attendees. I work for the Indian state of uh, Telangana. Many of you may be familiar with our capital city, Hyderabad. That is where I'm joining this conference from. India is largely an uh, agriculture country and uh, my province of Telangana is even more. In fact, uh, you spoke about uh, the problems of COVID uh, in your in introductory remarks, Diana. So in India as well, including in my province of Hyderabad, uh, my, my city of Hyderabad, my province of Telangana, we have been having a major struggle with COVID. But if you look at both last year as well as this year, the one shining spot amidst all this gloom has been agriculture both last year in the two cropping seasons as well as in this year's first cropping season we have had record production we have had record productivity of certain crops like rice and uh, that has been the only shining spot but the unfortunate thing is that the value capture that we expect to happen when so much of production so much of productivity is taking place it is not really happening at the level of the farmers in fact in india for uh, now more than two decades we have a very important national goal which is of doubling farmers income and the very fact that it is taking more than two decades and even now we are not nowhere close to achieving this goal shows that there are all kinds of barriers and obstacles in in getting closer to this goal so in and uh, one of the re, one of the consequences of not being able to double farmers income is that the younger generation you the theme that we are addressing today is demographic changes uh, India is an extremely young country. In fact, 65% uh, of our population is below 35. And uh, obviously, to young people, there are multiple other opportunities. There are services sector. India, as many of you would know, is a very important IT center. So lots of young people wish to get into the IT sector. Hyderabad itself is a very important life sciences, biotechnology center. Many people want to get into that. And there are so many other alternatives. So if you really want more and more young people to get into agriculture. One is that you'll have to work really hard in ensuring that the that the doubling of uh, farmers' income, that is an important national goal, that becomes a reality sooner than later. And the second thing is that if you want to really bring young people in the, in the game, I guess a huge uh, basket of technologies is very important. So what we have done in Telangana, both last year as well as this year is, that we have looked at all the processes that are part of the agriculture cycle, starting from how you prepare your farm, how you procure your inputs, then obviously all the farming operations, then pest management, nutrients management, then 
harvesting, storage, taking it to the market, even things like insurance in case there are crop failures. So every step of the agriculture process has been identified and we have been able to map all kinds of amazing technologies through which we can improve the efficiency of each of this process. And uh, uh, my team, myself and my team, we have been able to identify 80 plus such technologies, which of, of course include uh, emerging technologies like AI, ML, IoT, drones, and so data analytics, and so on and so forth. And uh, using a multi-stakeholder engagement model, the government, the startups, so many of these technologies incidentally are outcomes of uh, startup activities. Also, there are uh, technology companies, technology providers who have given us some of the solutions. The agriculture university, all stakeholders, uh, agencies like some of our palaces uh, represent, all of us in a multi-stakeholder uh, engagement model have been able to pilot many of these technologies. 17 have been piloted so far in the last two cropping seasons. And we are seeing very profitable results. And if we pursue this uh, line of thought that you enable uh, all these agriculture processes through technology. One, we will be able to improve the farmer's income, maybe bring it as much as possible, closer to doubling that. And in this process, we'll be able to attract the younger generation also. So my personal feeling is that the experience of ours in the Indian province of Telangana is very illustrative, very educative of how we have to make a big difference, a significant and sustainable difference in agriculture uh, uh, processes. Thank you very much, Jayesh. And um, I agree, a multi-stakeholder approach has to be uh, championed and advocated. And that what Julia had mentioned earlier, that it has to be um, based on collaboration. And then, um, you know, you talk about doubling uh, farmers' income and, you know, nurturing local ecosystems. And it, it has been two decades. And now this would mean um, that, did you think that it would actually work with better agricultural processes? I, I think yes. I think we should actually be optimistic and be positive. And then it flows nicely to Tanya. Um, you know, Tanya Woods, it's, it's 9 a.m. No, it's 5 a.m. Um, in, in, in Canada right now. Thank you for joining us. And you have worked um, in, you know, at a policy level as well as a trade negotiator. And, you know, you speak a lot about feeding, um, you know, the poor in your own backyard. So um, I would like to hear more about what do you think about this? Mm, thank you. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. I'm not sure everybody is, but it's very early here. And I'm happy to start my day with all of you. Um, you know, agriculture underpins our country in Canada. We're an incredibly large agricultural producer. Um, what happens when we don't have food? It doesn't make sense for a country like Canada to not have access to food. Hunger doesn't make sense in Canada. Hunger doesn't make sense, frankly, in any developed nation, and it shouldn't make sense in any developing nation. And yet it lives in our backyards every day. And this is the struggle that one of the many, but one of the core struggles we started looking at back in 2013, when, when I got very frustrated that I could see all of these resources around me and yet they were going to waste or they were not being matched to need. Um, fast forward to COVID, I mean, we've spent the better part of almost 10 years thinking through how do we meet needs with existing resources in a more philanthropic context, considering not money available, but goods available. And food is a great example. Food is the basis, as we all know here, food is the basis of our ability to learn. It's the basis of our health. It's the basis of our existence. We can exist without food and clean water, two, two core staples, right? Um, and then the rest follows from there. So we got very frustrated, but we saw what was happening with the pandemic and immediately new supply chains would be disrupted, whether it was agricultural workers getting sick, whether it was, um, you know, producers appreciating that there was supply chain disruption and increasing prices. So retailers increasing the prices and producers increasing prices um, and starting to see creep up uh, and more exclusivity around food and access to food. Uh, our food banks across this country cried out for help to the government. Uh, and we saw around the world very significant impacts on the supply chain, so significant that, of course, the World Food Program, um, a little, little more than a year ago now, called out for the introduction of in-kind supply chains. And this is where I've existed since 2013, is how do we structure in-kind supply chains in a way that can benefit locally, but equally internationally, where in-kind is not a dirty word, and in-kind in the international uh, humanitarian aid space is treated a bit like a dirty word. It's treated as bad uh, and not supportive. And so started to think about, well, 
clearly there's still waste, regardless of how we feel about in kind, there's still waste and there's still hunger. And so how do we match resources and needs and what's available today, whether it's one potato, whether it's someone who knows how to build an irrigation system, whether it's someone who can drive the food from one place to another place, it doesn't matter. How are we going to do this? And the, the problem is not scarcity of resources. The problem is challenges with supply chain management and logistics. That's our view of the world. And so we built a technology platform over the last seven years that actually just allows any nonprofit or community organization to say, you know what, in my space, I'm serving X number of people and I need lettuce, rice, beans, whatever, simple things. And on the other side, if I'm a farmer, if I'm a store, if I'm any kind of agricultural producer, I can answer and I can say, I have one extra potato. I have an extra bags of rice. I have five extra bottles of canola oil, whatever it may be. Um, and we allow that match to happen for free. We don't charge for it at all. It's entirely philanthropic. Um, and so we thought, well, the technology might just help fix some of that resource challenge, but we have to do more. And I think Julia made a very good point on partnership and collaboration. I mean, we exist entirely with our global movement called Project In Kind to serve those SDGs and put them into action in our backyard and around the world. How do we do that in such a way that it's easy, that I can wake up if I'm a producer and I can just say, okay, I want to go do this thing right now and I want to see what happened from it. We need data, we need partnerships, and of course the platform does, does that as well. The overarching comment though continues to be mindset change and in this space, Agriculture is abundant, it is robust, and it is abundant globally. If we take a very macro view, now we have to put it into micro action. And this is where we focus most of our time. It is about partnerships. It is about collaboration. I had the pleasure of speaking with Diana yesterday for the better part of an hour. I was glad that I couldn't log on because I got to hog her time afterwards. And we realized, wow, we can actually do something together with our technologies. We can make them interoperable which is important, but we equally have to make our relationships interoperable and our resources interoperable to meet needs. So it's not just about high tech, it's about very low tech, it's about human relationships. So that's where we focused. Thank you very much, um, Tanya. And interoperability, that's really important. And not only in the technology perspective, but in a social perspective, social science perspective as well. And then, it, you know, I like what you said about you know, in kind supply chains, how do we do that with dignity? How do we still retain everyone's dignity while we, um, you know, provide in kind food, mm -hmm. you know, to people who need them? And then um, interoperability. So this is where Dr. Pietro, uh, you know, where you would speak now about technology, their roles, and, you know, we have the collaboration part of things, and now it's a how to. So, how do um, technologies, the different technologies, would help? Uh, Dr. Pietro, we can't hear you. Ah, the interesting part, no? <laughs> nope. Okay. Um, nope. Can you hear us? Okay, so Dr. Pietro, while you di disconnect your microphone and connect again, let's, let me give the mic to Mark. Um, and, and Mark, uh, well, you know, perhaps you could elaborate on that. And I know we, we, we spoke about, you know, the one of the not so common topic, rare topic that we touch upon, natural resources management and, you know, cost, um, you know, including that cost into the supply chain. Perhaps you could expand on that, um, you know, while we move forward with this, yes. Well, yeah, I'll certainly try to, um, Diana, um, and, and maybe go a little bit beyond that. Um, first of all, great to, to be part of this panel, real, real honor and um, uh, to, be, to be part of the conference today. Um, I rather provocatively said to Diana, Diana I'd, I'd like to, to reframe the question in some ways. Um, it's not just demographic, but environmental and climatic changes that are gonna place increased pressure on our farm and food system in the decades to come. And, and it needs to become more resilient and sustainable than it is today. Um, arguably, it is not. And, and let me just share a few, a few facts that, that illustrate the point for me. 
Um, we have 800 million people going to bed hungry every day, 2 billion more suffering from micronutrient deficiencies, and yet we waste 1.3 billion tons of food every year, one third of all the food um, that is produced for human consumption. When we look at it from the biodiversity and environmental perspective, 60% of our biodiversity has been lost over the last 40 years, um, by some estimates, somewhere in the region of 24 billion tons of fertile soil is lost um, every year due to, due to erosion. Um, another fact that, that I always find interesting, we produce one million plastic bottles which are bought every, um, one million plastic bottles are bought every minute, and yet up to 80% of that um, ends up in landfill or tipped into the environment, causing untold damage um, to our oceans. And so when I look at this, I, I try to think about what are the building blocks of a more resilient and sustainable food system. Um, some of which colleagues on the panel have already touched on. Firstly, as you rightly said, um, Diana, um, for me the first thing is, is improved natural resource management and accounting. Um, to be clear and honest with ourselves, future economic development and well-being um, depends on us understanding and accepting um, the fact that we have to live within the planetary boundaries that we've got and we have to treat and value the natural resources that we use and um, responsibly, whether we are as individuals or as corporate organizations or governments. And then linked to that from the farming perspective, um, perhaps a more regenerative approach to farming, the place is more of an emphasis on restoring and enhancing the capacity of land systems and moving beyond the do no harm principle. And then as other co colleagues have already said, recognizing that innovation um, is critical to this. Innovation in technology, whether it's modern seed breeding techniques, bio-based inputs to big data and digitization, use of remote sensing technology, but innovation also in farm practices. Um, tremendous things going on at the farm level and evolving farm practices that make us more sustainable and resilient. And then when we think about um, innovation in new business models, perhaps thinking more from the starting point of how we made the food and land system um, more resilient and sustainable. Um, fourthly, and, and here I really want to re reinforce what Jayesh um, said earlier, supporting and rewarding growers for um, the public goods that they provide in environment and looking after biodiversity is critical. Supporting growers in making this transition to a more regenerative approach, the technologies that they need, the practices that they need, that is absolutely critical. It can come through public subsidy, but it also has to come through the market. And arguably, we're not sharing the, um, the, the value across the chain uh, as much as we could. And that's going to be critical, I think, if we are to attract the next generation that, that, that Jayesh um, uh, spoke about. So we've got to take on that challenge of how we share value more equitably through the chain. Um, we have to have a, a more open and honest discussion, in my view, on this interactional relationship between the, the price of food and consumption, particularly in the global north, um, and what that means for diet and the impact that has on our healthcare systems and, um, and waste. This imbalance between overconsumption in some parts of the world and, and undernourishment in another is something we have to take on. And then, sixthly, as we talk about the demographic change from rural to to urban areas, somehow we've lost a, a sense of where our, our food comes from. And so I, I do think what the European Union is talking about in terms of the sustainable food labeling framework um, that helps to educate and build awareness of consumers on the social, cultural, as well as the economic, diet and climatic impact of their food um, is certainly something that is well worth considering. And that's what we're trying to do at the Forum for the Future of Agriculture, which is predominantly based in, in Europe, but we, we have a global uh, view as well. Um, would reiterate what Ju Julia said, no one organization has a, all, all the answers. We have to work together. We have to work together in an engaged and open-minded way. And we need a lot more room for pragmatism and a lot less, ideolo uh, lot, lot less room for, for some of the ideology that often infuses um, these de debates. And we have to act now. The urgency is with us because in the time since I started um, speaking, we've wasted another 12,000 tons of food. And by the end of the day, I'm told that we could have wasted another 66 million tons of soil lost through erosion. So um, we don't have much time to waste. We've got to get on to this. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I, I, I agree. Biodiversity is critical. And now we see farm to fork traceability being also very critical and key in um, cross-border trading, even in like what Julia mentioned as well, 
in consumers wanting to know where their food comes from. And and then now let's let's uh, try to go back to Dr. Pietro. Now can you? The, oh yes, oh, we can hear you. And then then it flows nicely, Dr. Pietro, where you can then. That's why we love technology. technology. I came in yes. early to test, and it didn't work when, <laughs> when we needed. <laughs> That's fine. We fixed it <laughs> this time. Uh, but let, I wanted, you know, I started because I saw that Dayeshi was here before in the in the audience, so I just wanted uh, uh, to 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 welcome him after the, the, the COVID, but I saw he's, he's, he's gone. And I know you are a wonderful guest and wonderful host anyway, so uh, thanks for, for doing this. Um, I heard beautiful things, and, and this is what we try to, to do at Competitor.eu, and where we try to develop policy for innovation and, and sustainability. We are based in Italy. We have an office in Milan and one in, 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 in Brussels. And exactly, we, we try to do, you know, we try to analyze what new technologies are and how this can enable uh, in the agriculture, particularly farmers globally and all around the world, but what kind of policies we need to facilitate uh, uh, this. And what you said is very important, but we know that, uh, and I, I agree very much with, with what Mark said, and I just want to add a couple of things. First of all, that we are 7.6 billion now, aiming to be 10 billion people. And if we look at the data of the World Health Organization, each of us should take or intake between 2,000 to 2,500 kilocalories per day, that's a huge amount of energy that we probably need or we don't need so much, but this is what we're getting. In India, it's 2.5. In Europe, it's around 2,000. Some people are actually getting more in terms of overconsumption. So we need basically energy. And in order to produce energy, and I'm going back to, uh, to, to, to what uh, Julia said earlier, we need land and we need to use this land. Uh, so unless we're moving to Mars, as somebody's aiming, uh, we should stay within the borders where we are now, and we should, you know, try to develop new technologies in terms of new crops, for instance, that are much more productive, or for the moment, we have to cope with the crops we have. And in this, I'm going back to Mark and what he said, that uh, we don't need an ideological approach, but we need a science-based uh, approach. And so choose what is the best for us. Uh, but we also have to look at reality. Europe, uh, like the, the U.S., are big consumers, uh, but we import most of our impact on on the environment, and that's this is a uh, this is a big issue. Uh, we're still trying to make European agriculture, for instance, much more technological in terms of uh, 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 smart farming, or, or, or as you want to call it, there are different ways. Or IoT enabling technology like uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain. Those are useful and incredible useful tools. But then we need to create infrastructure. And in Europe, there is still, and I'm talking about Europe, and I'm not talking about developing countries, there is a, 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 what we call a communication gap. Only 50% of the rural area are without broadband. So if we want to bring technology there, we need first to bring the infrastructure. And phone companies, telecom companies often don't want to go there because they consider them gray areas or black areas where they don't have a return of investments. Uh, there is a skill gap. And here... Uh, what I said uh, earlier about Jayesh that is very is very important is training. And again, in Europe, 30, 31% of population in the agriculture, so workers, is over 65. So it's hard to train them. And only uh, uh, 6% is over 35. And we read a lot about young people approaching uh, a smart agriculture, but still is a, is a small group that just hits the media. Uh, so how do we train them? And uh, basically, only 70%, and I'm talking about Europe, have no basic technical skills. There are single workers that they go to work to the to the fields, and only age or less than less than 10% of workers have technical skills in farming. So we pro that's a, that's an issue. There is an issue of cost. Uh, 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 many farms, in particularly small holders, they have a, a, a problem is accessing accessing loan. And if you need to, to buy technology, if you need to buy platform, if you need to use platforms, you need loans from uh, from banks and from government. And small agriculture, small farmers cannot access uh, access to uh, to that. But there is also an energy cost. Uh, uh, farming is producing energy, but at the same time, farm is consuming a lot of energy. And particularly if you're using technology, technology is beautiful. If we think about sun power, if we think about uh, wind power, but at the same time. New technologies, as you know, from data sets, databases, and so on, uh, or farm uh, data farms, are consuming a lot of uh, energy, are producing CO two as well. So this is another issue we have uh, we have to cop. So what what's the ending point? The ending point, and I agree very much, is that we need to find cooperation or collaboration, but it should be a partnership where governments are in, 
together with the rest of uh, of society. Uh, thanks to COVID, and I'm sorry for saying that, we saw a um, better participation of governments in, in many economic fields. Some people might not like it. I personally think it was necessary right now to come in, but not just because of COVID, because of how things were uh, uh, were turning around. COVID just demonstrated that we were our globalization was very fragile, that our supply chains were very, uh, very fragile. So we need that kind of partnership in research. We've been showing in the US and Europe that partnership in research for vaccines has worked out, apparently. I think this could work out better for, uh, uh, for uh, agriculture. We need more infrastructure. Um, we did some research here in Italy. Uh, I know that telecom companies would like to invest if we receive some incentives. We need the so-called last mile. You know, broadbands are around us, but there is the lack of the, basically, the last mile that brings connectivity. And then we need to work on, on, on skills. Uh, I hear a lot of my students that they love into entering sustainability, but they all like to enter management in big companies. None of them is going to agriculture. Uh, and this is because agriculture, and we have to be honest, is still considered like a low income activity. Instead, when we need engineers, we need people with skills, I think there is a work of education that is not just transferring skill, uh, but as Tanya said earlier, we need a mindset. And I think I would like to hear my students saying, hey, I don't want to be just a CEO or a CFO or whatever, yeah. or a sustainability management manager. I would like to become a farmer. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Pietro. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you on the smallholder farmers, right? How do we bridge that connectivity gap? And, uh, you know, we need broadband, we need infrastructure. And the interesting thing is sometimes it's not about connectivity because uh, if you look at the African continent, uh, when, when I just want to share a little here since we are on time. Uh, but we, 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 when, when I was at um, African Union Commission in 2019 and we spoke to policymakers um, across the African continent, we spoke to numerous African, um, it, depending on their countries, the, the farming association bodies, and they said that it's not that, you know, we, we do not know how to use the mobile phones, we do not have connectivity, it's whether... Do we, do they have access? Do they have digital access? Do people go to them? They're assuming, oh, it's Africa. It's it's in it's, a, it's so far away. It's, it's in the you know it's in emerging countries. Could they produce for us food? The thing is, there is vast farmland in that part of the world. In you know in in, in numerous uh, OIC countries as well in in Middle East. And now that comes what I agree with what Tanya would um, said. Food is a basis of our existence. And here I, I would like to go back to um, Julia. And Julia, you've done amazing work at crop crop life. And you know, um, Dr. Pietro talked about you know educating the young. And in your work in crop life, how have you been seeing that? Is it still you know um, is a young being proactive in feeding the world? Thanks, Diana, and uh, listening to the comments of uh, the colleagues here, Tanya earlier and Mark, I mean, uh, how access, uh, in order to engage youth, how access to full access to innovation is uh, is also key. So the way we see uh, Crop Life International also to engaging the young, but engaging the broader, the broader stakeholders community is also uh, going through pioneering solutions that can have uh, positive impacts on people and on the natural world. For, so, for instance, uh, developing with uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, young um, scientists, uh, climate smart solutions that can make uh, agriculture more resilient for smallholder farmers. Uh, and then um, through this uh, a new scientific approach, we can grow more nutritious food, uh, as, as also Mark and uh, Pietro were saying, with less resources for uh, a hungry world. So let me, let me give you some examples. And scientists, uh, young, uh, young scientists are developing uh, drought salt tolerant varieties of uh, staple crops like maize and rice. They're also pioneering uh, new seed treatments uh, um, and coating to protect the crops from pests and diseases. This is really very much coming from a, a young, vibrant communities of researchers and students that they are also, I would say, technologies uh, neutral and that they can embrace in techn technologies for uh, really the 
ultimate uh, um, uh, greater good. Um, and also we see uh, how game-changing solutions uh, uh, are coming from the tech. Uh, game changing tech to support uh, farmers to to uh, adapt to uh, unpredictable uh, weather and disease. And again, we see how also young um, uh, young generation raise digital agriculture. Um, as uh, uh, as also Mark uh, was mentioning earlier, how uh, it's a, how you know we see more uh, diagnostic apps. Uh, uh, Farmers can use uh, the, their phones uh, to identify, in, in the case of the plant, plant site support pests uh, and determine in a very, uh, uh, very precise way the best treatment. So we see also drones uh, buzzing around the farms today, supporting farmers. So, um, so in a nutshell, we go back to the key word of innovation, and I would say innovation is key. Uh, and to resonate also what Tanya said, access. Uh, to food access to innovation is also crucial. Thank you very much, Julia. And we do have questions from the floor. And um, and I and and what I'm doing, if you guys notice, is round robin, right? And so this is uh, uh, Dinesh actually asked a very good question, which um, both Jayesh and Tanya could answer. So the question is: We have always seen at government to government partnerships, public private partnerships to tackle food issues. Will there be? private-private partnerships addressing food security looking in the future. So obviously, um, the question is for everyone here, but then uh, perhaps Tanya or Jayesh, you could, you could, um, you know, any one of you could on the mic and speak. So, <clears throat> uh, Diana, allow me to add something else very briefly, and then I will certainly yeah. respond to my friend Dinesh's question. See, uh, one point which uh, uh, Professor Pietro alluded to, Tanya spoke about, he spoke about training, she spoke about education. The point to ponder really is that all these technologies that we are speaking about today, they have been there for quite some time. It is not that we have suddenly discovered them. But why is it that the adoption, the penetration is very less? Why is it that only a handful of farmers have adopted these technologies, have benefited from them? And uh, the scenario in emerging countries, emerging markets like India is very, very different. See, we already have a very strong incidence of digital divide, both uh, access to digital infrastructure and digital literacy. Even if you have access, the ability to use that uh, infrastructure is very, very limited. So these are given. Of course, the governments are trying their best to supplement more digital infrastructure, run digital literacy programs, but still can something still be done? So in uh, my province, we have also factored this reality that there will be delays in adoption and would not like to miss the bus, so to say. So what we have found out is that uh, if you organize the farming community, if you create strong receiving mechanisms, strong groups, and then if you identify a couple of people who are digital champions, who understand technology, might have gone to college to some level. And if you are able to use them to get into the communities and then spread the technology, the adoption is faster. And even those, see, when you have seen digital divide for generations, for years, the typical mindset is technology is not for us. We don't speak English. We don't uh, live in the cities. We can't uh, figure out what a computer is. And therefore, it is not for us. So you are able to kind of uh, break that kind of a mindset and show to them that, look, here is someone from you, your community itself, who is able to master this technology, who is able to go forward. So the important point of extension, and that to a very immersive kind of an extension, is also very important and goes beyond training and education. Those are definitely very important, but something else, else as well. And of course, very quick remarks on what uh, Dinesh has asked about. About uh, when I spoke about the multi-stakeholder engagement model, I have seen, actually I have seen here in my province itself on how private uh, companies are getting together. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We found that there are certain technologies which are uh, important for a particular stage of agriculture operations. We found very good synergies between a large technology provider and some startups. The technology provider onboarded the solutions of the, that startup and kind of developed something which is much more useful. So we have many examples of private-private collaboration and hopefully that is something which will expand further. Thank you very much, Jayesh. Um, digital champions, I love that. Now, Tanya, on to you. I'll be, I'll be brief. I mean, in, in the time that we've started 
uh, Kind Village, and it's morphed into the global movement of Project in Kind. We've had over 500 private partnerships. Uh, we've had three government partnerships, and they've been at the most high levels. Um, but the one on food I shared with Diana was called Feed the City, Feed Your Soul. Uh, we also have another partnership in India at the moment with Skillsonics and WaterAid India to help advance the judge of admission. Uh, and we're very focused on leveraging the resources we have. So let's not put the pressure on the system. In our case, we're saying we don't want your money. I mean, we want to take a little bit, but we don't really want your money. We're not here for a handout. We're here for some training. We're here for putting into practice what we actually need. And we're, we're open to finding clever ways of doing this. In the case uh, for Feed the City, we said we want to feed an entire city of one million people in one day. How can we do it? And how can we do it with no money? I mean, this is, a, this is ridiculous when you think about it. How could we feed a whole city with no money? And we did it. Uh, we managed it. We did it leveraging resources. We leveraged the grocery stores. We leveraged the farmers. We leveraged the government. We leveraged uh, all of the relationships that we had, but it was the partnerships and the relationships that brought the food, that cooked the food, that prepared the food, that gave a place to eat the food together. And we did it. We proved it. And it, it, there was never a dollar that changed hands. In the case of India with Judge of Admission, um, there we're working with a training school and we're saying, look, can we take the apprentices who you're training with these skills to do plumbing and water infrastructure, and can we partner with WaterAid India, and can we ask them where they need the water infrastructure to grow the crops, to have access to drinking water, or water to use to do whatever they need to do with it? Uh, sanitation is a basic idea here, of course, in times of COVID. Can we take their apprenticeship hours, and can we, we ask them to go specifically to this place? to do this work with water aid. And in fact, that's what they're doing. And it's it's remarkable what's starting to happen because the minute you build in a thoughtfulness and awareness of what's happening in your community, you might think you know, but you generally don't always know what's happening. You know what you see, not always what's there. You start to build out more, um, more mindful thinking, more open-mindedness around resources and partnerships and, and real change can happen at the deeper infrastructure level. Thank you, Tanya. So um, we left three more minutes and um, I would like uh, Dr. Pietro and, and Mark, I, I, this topic, we need like, I think half a day, even more to discuss. So I would like um, Dr. Pietro and Mark to, to, to give your last um, comments on this before we end this um, wonderful panel session. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief and I assume you can hear me this time. Um, yes. Just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more working on the policy side, so I can't go into details in what you act in the next in a way I've just, uh, I've just said. I, I'm just, as I've read in the, in the chat, I just think that Europe is doing a gigantic leap forward. It will take time, will probably create a lot of uh, unhappiness, but as well as a lot of expectation is the farm to fork that Julia mentioned earlier, the zero deforestation program that will be uh, released early by the, uh, very soon by the European Commission. Those are, again, big steps with a lot of contradiction. There will be some ideology in there. Uh, there will be field for discussion, and I think is where all of us should be uh, should be engaged because this is not just about food entering Europe, but it's about a benchmark that Europe can establish. The U.S. might follow, Canada as well, UK as well, and so on. And it's important because it sets some standards for uh, certification, for instance. And I know I'm speaking very soon in a conference, and I know they don't like certification in this uh, sort of business uh, that I'm not mentioning. Uh, but uh, there are other players that have been, you know, very top players in terms of certification. But then is how to com communicate certification, for instance, to consumers. And then we go to the frontal pack, because at the very end, there is a consumer that consumes food and is buying, you know, these little packages with a lot of things on it. And it's very important to tell them, for instance, the source of that product, where the product is coming from, how it's being sourced still there. And I think here we need a partnership, a partnership again from the government, partnership from the industry, but we also need a partnership from NGOs and no longer uh, traditional NGOs like green groups. I think uh, Mark, Tanya, uh, uh, Julia, all of us with different approaches and perspectives should bring that there in a very, in a very constructive way. I took away all the time from Mark, sorry. <laughs> yes, Mark. <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'll be really sharp and just say in this area of public private partnership, um, scale is important and um, and moving beyond the you know the, the projects are important but that we need to be um, to, to move beyond the discrete. So carbon farming is a good one. Um, the EU through its subsidy policy can support the transition of growers to regenerative agriculture, given the tools that they need. 
but also give them the space for growers to earn carbon credits from, um, from the market, from companies that need to offset their unavoidable emissions. That, that could be a really scalable um, solution that delivers a win for the environment, a win for the grower, and a win for society. There you go. Thank you very much, Mark. Very succinct. Okay, so uh, we have come to, to the end of our session. And, um, you know, very wonderful to have everyone here. It was a great sharing, and I hope more people could see this. And um, have a great day. I know, Dr. Pietro, you have a conference next in Singapore. All the best. Right. From our own. Sonia, <laughs> Sonia, keep on sleep. And Julia, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye.